Uh, what we're going to do this afternoon is think about uh, spiritual growth. OK, so we're thinking about the whole uh, kind of idea of growing as a believer in Jesus, growing as a Christian. I've called it five steps to practical spiritual growth. I'm, I'm not sure if that's the right title. It's not practical in the sense that I'm going to be telling you what time you should wake up in the morning and how long you should read your Bible for. Okay, we might mention some things along the way, but that's really not the goal of what we're doing. What I want us to have is a, a really, in a way, quite a simple mindset kind of a framework so that we can understand spiritual growth and how it works and so what we're going to do in these five sessions is we're going to start by establishing what the challenge is we're going to think about the fall into sin and the the world that we live in now as a fallen world which is the context for our spiritual growth it's the kind of the thing that makes it difficult and so we're going to start there and then we're going to have a couple of sessions there are five sessions okay so five 20 minute sessions and uh, the two and three second and third session we'll be thinking uh, about the way God wants us to grow the way he's designed uh, for us to grow as followers of Jesus uh, again more framework rather than lots of specifics but we'll look at some bible passages we'll uh, kind of make it clear hopefully what it is uh, that we're invited to pursue as Christians and then the fourth session we're going to think about some of the kind of distractions some of the ways that we can lose focus and get distracted onto other things uh, that can hinder or get in the way of our spiritual growth and then in the final session uh, our fifth session together we will uh, think about how actually spiritual growth is corporate it's not individual we're not designed to kind of fight this battle alone and so we're going to think a little bit about some of the uh, the the connections the relationships around us that god has given to us in order to be able to pursue growth spiritually so let's jump in uh, to the first one so understanding the power of fallen world gravity let me just pray for us as we launch into this father thank you thank you for your desire for our growth and i pray that as we think about that this afternoon or this morning wherever we are in the world lord i pray that we would be helped and motivated and that our lives our walks with uh, your son would grow closer and deeper in the process in jesus name we pray amen so fallen world gravity that that's a, a phrase that i've come up with to to try and help us think about the constant context in which we live we live in a fallen world and there is a power that is pulling us away from what god has for us uh, i suppose we could talk about this session as chewing on the onion now there may be some countries where you enjoy chewing on onions i'm not criticizing uh, that if you think that's helpful it's certainly healthy and uh, hopefully this session can be healthy for us but an onion is uh, known for having multiple layers and when humanity fell into sin that little conversation between the serpent and eve is so instructive but the more you look at it the more you discover how many layers there are in the fall or in the words that were spoken by the serpent so we're going to think about that we're going to chew on the onion a little bit and think about the lie now it's interesting we haven't got time to do this but if you want to make a note of these four bible passages in the new testament all four of those refer to the lie they're usually translated without the the definite article and so they'll be translated a lie or lies or falsehood but in the underlying text, it's the lie. It's kind of definite. And uh, it, it's kind of an interesting thing to ponder. Is the writer of the New Testament passage referring to Genesis 3? And what are the implications of that? That's homework. That's not something we're going to look at together now. Uh, but uh, the lie. Let's look at Genesis 3. Okay, here's the famous passage. Let me just read it to you. 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So this is where sin enters into the story. Right. This is where sin becomes uh, a part of uh, our experience and, and our history. And this passage here really helps us to understand the world we're living in every moment of every day. Before this, of course, we've got Genesis one and two, right? the glorious, uh, overwhelming creation account where we see God's generosity. From Genesis 1, I think it's verse 11 onwards, it feels like every single line is speaking of God's abundance and generosity, and, and there's this kind of relational richness to it all. He creates man in his image, male and female, he creates them. Then you get into chapter 2, and the climax of the whole creation account is the wedding of Adam and Eve. And so Eve is brought to Adam. Adam, the gardener, becomes a poet. And it's kind of this climactic moment at the end of chapter two. And the final verse, uh, I'll just make a note up here. The final verse is verse 25 of chapter two. And it says they were naked and they were not ashamed. OK, so they were naked and they were not ashamed. However, when you come down to verse seven here, the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And so in the space of those verses, something massive has changed. Something very significant has happened that has moved them from this state of, how would we put it, total unawareness of self to a profound awareness of self. And so what happens in between here is therefore incredibly significant. I just want to zero in on it and basically try to unravel the onion a little bit. What is it uh, that has introduced such a radical change into our world? Okay, so here we are just starting at four, verse four, going down to verse seven. And uh, we could look at the whole thing, but just for the sake of your eyes, I thought I'd, I'd zoom in a little bit. So the layers of the lie. If we were in a classroom together, we could look at this and discuss it and we could take a, a good time to do this. I'd encourage you to look at this passage yourself later and, and just notice how many of these layers jump off of the page at you. But let me lead you through it uh, for now, just to help us. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, let me, I've got myself right over what I'm looking for here. Okay, so you will not die. The serpent says there, you will not surely die. Did they die? That's the question, right? Did, did they die in the day that they ate of it? You could say, well, no, they didn't. They lasted for hundreds of years after, according to the text. Well, true, physically, they didn't die in that instant, but they began to. But spiritually, relationally, death came immediately. There was a separation between them and God. There was an immediate change of uh, connection or fellowship between them and, and each other, right? And so death enters in. But the serpent is saying, <clears throat> you're not going to die. Look at me. I'm on the other side and I am still alive. 
okay so there's one element one piece of the lie there's this element here god knows when the serpent says god knows it's kind of like what he said before at the start of the passage did god really say it's introducing doubt about god's word and god's heart god's character is god holding something back from his creation there's more uh, there's the implication can we trust him because if he knows something that he's not letting on if he's holding back something that we would do well to have access to then can we really trust him and then we get down to uh, kind of a key phrase here you will be like god what's the right answer to that question what should eve have said to that question i was just reading uh, a book about uh, dietrich bonhoeffer's theology talking about uh, creation fall and redemption and it's talking about uh, how god was in creation at the center and then adam was created uh, free but not with the same kind of freedom god had he had a freedom for relating to god and loving others but to say you will be like god is not to say uh, well, it is to say you can replace God at the center. That was what they went for, that you can become the center. You can have a God type of freedom instead of a, a bounded human freedom. Uh, and so Eve should have said no, right? She should have said, no, I cannot be like God. We cannot be like God. He's unique and we cannot do what he does or be who he is. And yet at the same time, she could and should have said, yes, I am like God, because Adam's told me, probably from Genesis 1, we're made in his image. And so, yeah, I am like him, but I'm not like him. You see the, the, the complexity to what's being shared here by the serpent. It's an invitation not to uh, enjoy who you are in relationship to this uh, oh, great, wonderful, generous, loving being. It's to push him aside and take his place, to put yourself at the center. Well, there's more. Is there a power that comes from knowing? There's an implication here that for Adam and Eve, they don't know something and they're missing out. But if they know both good and evil, they'll be in a better place. And then there's more as the passage unfolds. Uh, this whole issue of my choice is how I define life. She looked, she saw uh, and processed, imagined, dreamed, whatever word we want to use there and acted. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. She went in deceived. He went in eyes wide open. But there was a sense here that there was a uh, definition of life by having the freedom to choose anything, to having no restrictions. God cannot be trusted. God can be put to one side. I can put myself at the center. I can choose what's best for me i i i my choice that was very significant and i'll just put one more right at the bottom they sewed fig leaves together if you think about it they were offered godlike status what did they discover they discovered their own nakedness right they thought that they were going to uh, get uh, something more but really, all they added was evil. They already had some knowledge of good. And now they've added knowledge of good and evil. They've added evil into the mix. They've added the discovery of their own inadequacy. And suddenly now they are having to hide that. Hide from each other. Hide from God. Put on fig leaves and pretend that they are something they're not. Pretend that they are adequate. And that is what we humans have been doing ever since, isn't it? We all fig leaf all the time. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't wear clothes. That's a positive thing. Uh, please do. But there's something about the way we portray ourselves to one another that is incredibly self-protective. I'm not a huge fan of spiritual disciplines as a concept, and I'll say more about that later on. 
But one discipline that may be helpful for us is when you get out of the shower in the morning, look in a mirror while you're still naked and ask yourself, is that a God? The vast majority of us will be reminded very quickly, that's not a God. Okay, there's a, maybe a few, a certain stage in life that maybe think they are. But for most of us, it's a good reminder, I'm not God praise God that he is. It's a good little gentle nudge first thing in the morning to reorient your world from this me-centered, I'm the core of everything, back to, no, wait a second, there's one on the throne and praise God, he's not me, right? So there's the lie. And we could dig deeper, we could find more, but let's look at it this way. In terms of the impact of fallen world gravity, the creator's design is that we should love God and love neighbor, right? We were created for this kind of uh, relationship dynamic where our gaze is fixed elsewhere. But what's happened? In the fall, that design has been corrupted. So instead of looking up and looking out, the core of our being is looking in. We've curved in on ourselves. Sometimes you might hear people quoting uh, Luther or even back to Augustine, this idea that we are homo incurvatus in say, we are curved in on ourselves. That's the kind of beings that we are. And that really is the issue. That really is the problem. And so typically we think of that manifesting as rebellious independence. I don't need God. I can do what I want. I'm free of all constraint. You know, I'm going to be the center of my own universe and the master of my own destiny. But it's also possible that that self-love can manifest as a religious independence. If you think about it, um, which way around should we go? Martin Luther, I just mentioned Luther. He talks about uh, humanity kind of living on a continuum. I think this is in his introduction to uh, the Galatians commentary, which is well worth reading. And at one end, he talks about vice, the evil. And at the other end, he talks about virtue, that which is perceived to be good. And he says that as humans, we are all on this scale somewhere, right? We're all somewhere along that continuum between vice and virtue. But the gospel is not to be found at this end. That's a mistake. We tend to think that if we can go from being uh, rebellious to being religious, then God must be at work. Tim Keller points that out in his book, The Prodigal God. He uses the story of the prodigal son to say, look, the gospel is not about turning younger brothers over here into older brothers over there. That's not the gospel at all, because this entire continuum has us curved in on ourselves. Right? We're either uh, rebellious towards that end or we're more religious and dutiful towards that end. But the gospel is God coming to us from a totally different dimension. He's coming to us, if you like, from above. So whether we are rebels or more self-righteous, uh, the call of the gospel, if you like, is a, a call from outside of this continuum. I do like the prodigal son story, younger brothers and older brothers, both needing to be rescued by a God who will humiliate himself in order to win our hearts back to relationship with him. Both of those brothers, if you look at the story closely, both of those brothers despised their father. Both of them wanted their father's stuff. Both of them wanted to have parties with their friends. Neither of them wanted to be close to their father. And yet the father on both, uh, for both sons, humiliates himself before the community, humiliates himself to try to win their hearts and bring them into the fullness of relationship with him. Fallen world gravity is continually pulling us away. Just as uh, gravity, like the traditional kind, pulls you towards the ground, whether you think about it or not. Have you noticed that? You don't need to concentrate on gravity for it to do its job. You know, it's not like you forget gravity for a moment and you start floating towards the ceiling. Something's 
weird if that happens. No, it's there whether we're aware of it or not. And the same thing is true with what I'm calling fallen world gravity. Even for us as Christians, we are constantly being pulled away from Jesus. I've put here this phrase that will pull your gaze away from Jesus. In the next sessions, we're going to think about how the Christian life begins and continues by the fixing of the gaze of our hearts on the person of Jesus Christ, which should be the most delightful, the most thrilling, uh, the most perfect thing ever. And yet, we constantly feel the gaze of our hearts being pulled away. We constantly feel like oh, it's hard. It's difficult. This is the most delightful thing ever. This is the, the person, uh, the, the second person of the Trinity who has delighted the Father for all eternity. There is none better than him. And yet I can so easily find myself drawn to anything else. Why is that? It's because of fallen world gravity. It's that curved inness that we have as humans that constantly pulls us back to think about me at the center instead of him. So there we go. We've come to the end of the first session. I'm going to invite Roxana to uh, come on and uh, bring some questions uh, for us as we're getting launched here. Thank you. So um, we have a question about, um, you, you mentioned the idea that uh, we are very self-protective in the way in which we, um, we uh, portray each other. So uh, the question is, how um, can the church be more proactive in creating a safe space, um, a space where people can be vulnerable and open and transparent, and a, a space where they know that they can find um, healing and restoration so that they don't um, keep being so self-protective? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. I think one of the challenges we've got in church world is that our tradition hasn't demonstrated this kind of humility that we're describing here so traditionally what what happens in church is that you get this separation between gospel and believer so the gospel is for the sinners out there but in here we are good people and i think over the years if you question uh christians they would admit that they're not but but it's very easy to fall into a sort of christian fig leaf where we're pretending that we don't have any problems anymore. The reality is we have huge problems still. We're still fully human and we still have all sorts of struggles and doubts and temptations and failures and so on. And so the church should be a community, not that looks like it's got it all together, but that is a community of people who are broken and real and not hiding uh, their sin from each other. But I understand why we do that. Now, how can we change that? One quick thought, um, just to avoid using 10 minutes on a good question, would be that we need to be preaching the gospel, not just to the lost out there, but we need to be preaching the gospel to each other. Because as we preach the gospel to each other, we're speaking to each other as fallen, broken beings who fail, who struggle, who have doubts. And in the context of that being more normal, hopefully then we can be more transparent with each other. Now, there's, there's technically a whole load of things that go into that, creating environments that feel safe, uh, making sure we don't have a community that has a sort of uh, legalistic, pressuring sort of intensity to it. And I think for those of us who are leaders, whether you're a pastor or a small group leader or a Sunday school teacher, you know, if you're influential in the church, then lead by example. I really struggle with that, but I, I know I need to. I need to, in my messages, include uh, reference to my own struggle rather than pretending or just not even pretending, just giving the impression that I'm fine, all is well. And so, yeah, let's lead by example, not by saying things that are totally distracting, but, but being transparent, being vulnerable, doing that in conversation, doing that in small groups, doing that in sermons, so that gradually the culture of the local church can become more and more um, transparent and real not because that's going to we don't want to glory in our sin at all but in order to glorify jesus because we're we're in need of the gospel we need his good news we're not people who are fixed so there's a start of an answer there thank you thank you very much peter um 
the next question is, uh, what can we do to focus our attention to Jesus instead of uh, the self? But that's that's a good question, and that's really what we're going to talk about for most of the rest of the afternoon. Uh, but it, it's a good question to kind of put into our own thinking and say, okay, what is it that's going to expose my heart to him? Um, so much, and we'll see this as we go on, so much of Christian um, teaching easily falls into pointing us to ourselves. And I'll come back to this. You know, we hear a sermon and we go away thinking, oh, I've got to try harder. And we teach the youth group and they go away thinking, oh, I've got to try harder. And we point each other to ourselves or to themselves rather than pointing to Jesus. And so uh, we've got to think about how can we do ministry that points to Jesus? How can we uh, preach to ourselves? You know, oh, my soul, I need Jesus. We need to be thinking about what are the ways that I can expose my heart to him on a regular, daily, frequent basis so that my heart can respond by looking to him. So that could be obviously Bible, uh, Christian music. It can be the conversations that we have, the tone of our theology in church world. Uh, the way we interact with one another during the week, there's a whole load of things that we should be thinking about. But I, I really am boiling it down in this uh, masterclass to the issue of, are we looking to him or are we looking to ourselves? We'll be tempted to look to ourselves. What we need is to keep our eyes fixed on him. Thank you. And the next question is, how do we effectively preach that type of gospel to each other that reflects our continuum um, struggle with our vice and virtue yeah i think we've got to become really aware of that vice virtue continuum because we so easily can fall back into uh celebrating virtue as if that's a, a result you know i sometimes give the example of um a, a guy who's famous in town for the the drinking that he does you know he's in the bar drinking incredible amounts of alcohol and everybody knows what a troublemaker he is and how he gets into fights and gets arrested and all of that. And then one day he sees an attractive lady walking into the church and he follows her in and discovers that the church isn't excited by his stories of great consumption of alcohol. And so he learns to do the church behavior, right? He learns to attend meetings, to dress a certain way, to say certain words, maybe to join the choir, join a committee or three, you know, get involved in ministry. And then the whole motivation might be that he's attracted to that lady, but the whole church will celebrate the power of the gospel. But the gospel hasn't had anything to do with it. He's simply moved from vice to virtue, but he's still completely self-concerned. So we've got to think, okay, how can we make sure that we're not falling into that trap, but instead we're recognizing the, the vertical dimension, what only God can do, what uh, has to be supernatural, not explainable on a natural level so yeah we're, we're going to talk more about this as we go on this afternoon thank you and um another question uh, one of our participants is telling us that um one question that um they often receive when talking to people about god as um fundamentally fundamentally loving and good is about what happened in genesis 3 why did he permit that why did he allow the devil to um, talk um, uh, to Adam and Eve? What, what are your thoughts on that, Peter? I have more thoughts on that than, than we can cover in about two minutes. But uh, sometimes I find it helpful to go from a question like that that is profoundly spiritual about God and humanity and just put it into human terms. Uh, I really love my wife, okay? would you recognize it as love if I locked her in the house and she had no option but to love me? You see, immediately love becomes quotes. It's like love if they're a prisoner. And so I think there's something there about um, how much more now and even in the future, in eternity future, how much more will the bride of Christ celebrate the love of God looking at the lamb looking as though he had been slain, seeing with their eyes just how great his love is for us, how much more is that uh, a recognition of God's loving nature than what Adam and Eve had before the fall? 
Now, it's not a complete answer, but I think we have to think in those terms. Did God know what he was doing? Yes. Does it always make sense? No. But ultimately, what's the end result? Well, the end result is a whole load of us with Jesus in heaven with zero desire to ever sin again. And I think that's that's pretty powerful with a far greater awareness of just how sacrificial God's love really is. Adam and Eve didn't know that. They knew he was generous. They knew he was powerful. They knew he was kind. They did not have a clue just how radically sacrificial God's love was. We have that because of the cross. And so that, that's kind of where I go trying to answer that question. It doesn't fully satisfy. It doesn't take away the, oh, but Lord, couldn't you have done something different? Ultimately, we have to trust him with that. But I think that's kind of the, the, the avenue to go down with that kind of a question. Did God know what he was doing? How has it played out? Yes, it's played out in incredibly negative ways, but if we're going to look at the negative, we've also got to recognize the positive too.